Amen. That song gets me going. Man, we are in a battle, you know, a battle for good, a battle for grace and truth. And we have an enemy. And Jesus Christ is the victor, but yet there's still a battle going on here. And he uses us as his instruments of grace and truth to make a difference in the world and to change this world and to fight with faith and valor Oh my goodness, it just reminds me of what's really going on in this world when I sing that song. And I'm so glad that he is our awesome God who is victorious. Hey, did everybody get an outline? Raise your hand if you did not get an outline. It would have been in your bulletin this morning. Um, We just started a challenge called the One Month to Live Challenge here at Calvary. And here's the challenge. Every day, ask yourself this question. What would you do if you knew you only had one month to live what would you do if you knew you only had one month to live and then live that way that's the next part right ask yourself that question what would i do if i only had one month to live and then live that way and we're all reading a chapter uh in this book every day it's called one month to live it's a new york times bestseller Last week, it's so exciting to see uh, how many people are really getting on board with this and resonating with this. We sold out of the books last week. Good news. We have more books this week, okay? And they're over in the ministry booth area, a whole bunch more that we got. So uh, if you haven't started, it's not too late. We would love to have you join us. But get that. We're reading a chapter from this book every day as a group. And we are, uh, all of our sermons, and then we also have, on Wednesday night, we have what we call our challenge group. And this room was just full last Wednesday night. It was exciting, full of people committed to live this no regrets life, a a life on purpose for God. And this week, uh, we focus on living a life of passion. Now, wait a second. Let me stop for a second. Big news. Big news. Our church is growing. This is a baby's first Sunday. And would you please stand, okay, oh, forgive me if I don't say this right, Serena, Serena Dawn Riggins, stand up, it is Austin and Cassidy's little baby, born April 9th, wow, yes, congratulations, we have a gift for you, and we are so happy for you, God loves babies. We do too. Calvary loves babies. Look how little. Yeah. Remember when you were that little? No, you don't. Uh, <laughs> that is exciting. We're very happy for you. Thank you for it. Thanks for coming so quickly, April 9th. And then here we are. What day is today? 14th. Already in church. Yep. Don't ever miss a Sunday. Uh, I'll tell you one verse that has really gripped my heart this week, and we talked about it Wednesday night a little bit, John 10.10, it's at the top of your bulletin there. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, and that's Jesus talking, of course, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You know, that's why I said that song really resonates with me, because it talks about that battle. Do you know that there is a thief? There is a thief in this world who comes to kill and steal and destroy there's a thief that has come to kill and to steal and destroy we are in the middle of a battle the good news is that Jesus Christ has come that they may have life and have it abundantly that is just that is in a nutshell what is going on in this world right now there is a thief who comes to kill and steal and destroy. And the devil and the power of sin is all around everywhere you look. But Christ has come that we may have life and may have it abundantly. That is the big picture, the big picture of, this, of sin and, de- and the devil. But Jesus Christ coming in as our great savior, as our hero who has conquered it, but yet we still have to deal with with it temporarily until the ultimate um, until we ultimately stand with our hero and you know what God has made us in his image and he has put a little bit of hero in every one of us Um, the thief is about the business of killing and stealing and destroying but God has put us in charge to fight this good fight and we need to find the courage to live passionately with God's passion it reminds me of a little cartoon I used to watch called Popeye the Sailor Man. Anybody ever seen that? 
Yes, there he is. Raise your hand again, all you old people who remember it. Yes. I think it was in reruns when I was watching it. And uh, uh, <laughs> Popeye the sailor man. Popeye was a kind-hearted sailor who had a beautiful wife, just, or girlfriend. Just look at her. She's just gorgeous. Uh, kind of a pickle nose and spaghetti arms and, and just a slave to fashion. I think she might be wearing Uggs or something, it looks like there. Uh, but anyway, and Olive, Popeye and Olive, Popeye would live, he'd try to be cool about it, you know, he'd, he'd be living and uh, Olive would maybe be talking to this big guy named Bluto, remember Bluto, he's an evil guy, and somehow she'd always get into trouble and Bluto would take her away and she would become a damsel in distress and Popeye would have to go and save her. That's the basic plot of every single Popeye cartoon, right? <laughs> And he would always, the secret ingredient that made him strong, of course, was spinach. Yes, he would eat spinach. He was strong to the finish because he ate his spinach, right? He would eat that spinach and amazing power would well up in, mostly in his forearms. And, <laughs> and Popeye would rise up. But there was a little phrase that Popeye would say when all of us got into trouble. He'd try to play it cool for a while, but there was this phrase where he would reach his boiling point and he would say, let's all say it together. It's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. Yeah. Now I'm going to say it again with more enthusiasm and in your best Popeye voice. Okay? <laughs> Here we go. It's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. That was Popeye, and he said he'd reach that boiling point. Um, and as we look at our passion, it will be tied to that cosmic struggle I talked about, how the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Christ has come to give us life and to give it abundantly. And we are here to work to do the work of Christ, but there will be a boiling point where we say, we, it's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. When I see the devil at work, I got to do something. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He's prepared works for us to do in this cosmic battle. The world will tell you to just look inside for your passion. What do you want to make your life happy? The Bible talks about passion that is far greater than just your own personal happiness. It's about something you see out there so that you can be used by God and he can well up his passion in you. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own int personal interests, but also for the interests of others, right? Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 2. Exodus 2, and I'm going to begin in verse 11. If you're using the Bible we provide, it's on Old Testament, page 42. And we're going to look today at the life of Moses. Moses was raised in Egypt in the lap of luxury. He, he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. But at some point, Moses realized that he wasn't an Egyptian. He was actually a Hebrew, just like all the slaves who were waiting on his family. Moses also was, who were waiting on his adopted family. Moses was also a Hebrew, just like them. And we're going to look at the moment... When Moses, like Popeye, said, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. This is how we get into your outline. I'm not a bad outline person, but I'm going to try to make sure I have you fill in the blanks because you guys like that. But we're going to find, find our passion, okay? Find our passion. Ask yourself the question. To find your passion, ask yourself the question, what can't you stand? What can't you stand? Exodus 2. Beginning in verse 11, it says, are you there? I love the sound of those papers flipping. That's great, those pages. It says, now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Do you see what happened? Moses had his Popeye moment. <laughs> he killed the Egyptian. Something in him reached a boiling point, and he said, I, I can't stand it anymore. These Egyptians are mistreating my people. I can't stand it no more. Some of the greatest movements in our history 
The greatest movements in the, in the world began when someone's passion was stirred and they simply said, enough. That's all I can stand. Martin Luther King couldn't stand racial oppression. He, he just couldn't stand to see whites only signs on fountains and in and bathrooms. He couldn't not stand to see segregation or blacks forced to sit on the back of the bus. Uh, blacks always at the end of the line for education, employment, housing. Martin Luther King could not stand to see the lynchings. That's all I can stand. I can't stand it no more. And he took a courageous and passionate stand. And his passion kept him going. When his house was bombed and his family received threats, he kept going and going with that passion. And, and that's just one injustice that the devil is... is that is doing there's lots of them no single christian or even a single church can fight all of the ways that the thief is coming to steal and to kill and to destroy and we need to find our thing what's your thing there's a lot of them out there you know that there's still slavery in this world there's homelessness there's sex trafficking divorce drug abuse there's there's no shortage of attacks on in this world god sees these things too and, and he stirs the heart of his people that we will be his instruments. Uh, look at James 1.27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself unstained by the world. Uh, what about giving a hand to the outcasts or the downtrodden in our society? Or around the world? You know, we have opportunities that we give you here at Calvary. I'll never forget Pastor Steve talking about the very first time he went to the mission field in Mexico and how he gripped his heart to see these people who he, that we could help, our youth kids could help. His heart was broken for the downtrodden and the people oppressed by the thief in Mexico. And he's been taking our kids uh, every couple of years to a trip. They're going to Nicaragua this, this year and they're going to be working with those orphans Orphans and widows in their distresses, as James 1 says. And, and, and growing a heart in our kids for that. And also being a help to those orphans that, that need it. Um, we have things like uh, Operation Compassion that we've just started. Get involved. It's a way to go over to the People City Mission and, and help them with the things that they need help with. Uh, Nicaragua's having a, a, a drive for some items that they're going to take and deliver to these to that country, the second poorest country in the world. Look up from your own life and see the fight. See where you can join the fight. You know, what can't you stand? What is it that grips you? What's that one thing? The next thing is, what gets you excited? What brings you fruitfulness and fulfillment? Okay. Now, if you've never been to our 301 class, this is a short commercial for 301 because we talk a lot in that class. The whole class is really about you finding fruitfulness and fulfillment in your life. Why did God make you the way he made you and give you the heart that he has given you and, and put you here at this time? May 5th, we're having a 301. If that's your next step on our ball diamond, Mark that on your card. I want to go to 301. It's a, it's a great class, and we take more time in helping you find your thing. How can you be an instrument of God? How can you serve and be used by him? And lots of exercises that we take you through that really help you with that and to help you find what is that, that passion God has put in, there, in you. And if you look around this church, it's a beautiful thing because there are people serving with all their hearts in places where they find fruitfulness and fulfillment you know your children right now are being taken care of and taught the word of god by people who find fruitfulness and fulfillment in that uh, they're right below us here <laughs> and 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 they love to make a difference in kids lives it, it excites them to see those light bulbs go on in your kids and to express the love of christ to them uh, this worship team that was up here today you know they want to help you see and express the greatness of your god they just love that. They love to see you guys engage and you guys to get a picture of God and to engage your hearts in make, being a blessing to him and worshiping him and opening your lives to him. Uh, the worship team just loves that. There's, there's lots of youth workers down there in the gym who are committing to help teenagers deal with what teenagers deal with in their 
specific situations that they have during that time of life, and they just love that. They love when they can be a difference. It excites them. And that's what we have here is a church full of people who are working in things that excite them, where they find fruitfulness and fulfillment. You know, 40 years ago, there was a skinny 20-something guy and his wife who came to Lincoln, Nebraska, and had, saw this vision and saw that all these things would happen. There would be programs for children. There would be a church where the pastor stayed <laughs> for 40 years and beyond. And what if that happened? You know, he had, Pastor Carl had that situation growing up. There was always a different pastor. Every time he'd get to know the pastor, uh, he would leave and a new pastor would come. And he's like, that's not what we need. We need a place where there's some consistency. And we need a thing where, where people are working who are excited about the whole family. And, and, and here birthed the church almost 40 years ago. By the way, another commercial. This, I'm working the commercials into the sermon. Have you noticed that? Circle June 9th in red, and don't miss church on June 9th, okay? That is our 40th anniversary, and we have lots of cool things planned that we're going to talk to you about later, but just save the date, save the date, make sure you have that, okay? But serving, what makes you excited? Where do you find fruitfulness and fulfillment? The next thing is to fuel our passion, fuel our passion. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Fuel your passion. Two things under fueling your passion. Integrity is important. Is your life pure? Are you walking closely with God, being fed by his word and living for his purposes? Because this whole thing, this whole passion and living thing is about joining God in his mission, in his power, finding his passion for you. Uh, you have to live with integrity. Follow his word because your passion needs to square up with his word or it's not the right passion, okay? Uh, intentionality. In Hebrews 11, it talks about Moses, intentionality. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, choosing rather, to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward intentionality it's a choice Moses made the choice he could have chosen to stay comfortably in in the palace in Egypt but he made an intentional choice and, and you know you have this choice from day to day during this challenge will you set your alarm early so that you have enough time to be in God's word and to read that chapter in the one month to live book you know are you going to make that choice so that every day you can do that living a life of passion it's not just about following your feelings when you come it's it's about making a choice to stay committed even when the feelings fade you're going to keep going it's it's intentionality intentionality and the last one is to follow our passion. Follow our passion. Let go of your limiting beliefs and follow in faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that it, he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews eleven six. 6. I brought... This rod today, because are you still uh, are you still in uh, Exodus, still in the book of Exodus? Your Bible's still open. Turn back there if you if you left. But we talked about how Moses killed the Egyptian, right? And after he killed the Egyptian, he saw two Hebrews fighting. Okay, now it's not Egyptian against Hebrew; it's Hebrew against Hebrew violence. And he's thinking this whole place is just imploding. And he said, "What are you doing?" And they looked up to him and said, who are you? What are you going to do? Are you going to tell on us just like, or are you going to kill us just like you killed uh, that Egyptian? And he's like, uh-oh, I tried to hide that Egyptian in the sand, but the word is out. They know. The word is out. I killed an Egyptian. I'm in big trouble. And Moses ran. He ran, made a new life for himself off in, off, uh, in Midian. And uh, for 40 years, he ran. He kind of took off with his passion, and then he kind of got burned, and then he ran. 
And for 40 years, 40 long years, and the story picks up 40 years later when Moses is now 80 years old. 80 years old. And he's a shepherd. We talk a lot about this at Christmas time, that shepherds, that's the bottom of the totem pole, right? That's the lowest job you could have. So here's Moses out in the wilderness, uh, out at the bottom of his totem pole, but he's made a little life for himself, you know? He's got a new family out there. He's got his sheep. He's got his rod that helps him to take care of the sheep. Let's look at Exodus 3, starting in verse 7. Exodus 3, 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen, surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. Okay, that's a key. God is also aware. So what God is basically saying to Moses is, you know that, you know that passion in your heart? You know that thing that when you saw it, it just wrecked you on the inside? God says, I see it. I feel the same way. Uh, That wrecks me too. I hate seeing that kind of violence. I hate seeing my people treated that way. Um, Verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Websites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites and the Mosquito Bites. Just kidding. I just always wanted to read that passage just so I can make that little joke. Uh, verse, I'm sorry, back to verse 9. Forgive me, Lord, for adding to your word there. Verse 9. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. God sees it. God sees it. You know, you ever wonder that? I can't believe this is happening. Does God see it? And Moses realized 40 years later, God says, hey, I see it. I see it. I've been waiting on you to be humble enough that I can use you. Verse 10, therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly, that's, I'm sorry, let me stop there. That's a question we all have, isn't it? Who am I? Mitch, I'm not Martin Luther King Jr., you know? <laughs> he was a hero. He was amazing with his talents and his abilities to go and do the things he did. I'm amazed at that. I can't do those things. I, I know you've got excited children's workers downstairs, but oh, they're heroes. That's not me. I can't handle it. I can't handle youth. Are you kidding me? What all they're going through, who am I? Who am I? Anyway, verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly, here's the key. God said, certainly, I will be with you. And I love that. He didn't say, oh, Moses, you're a great guy. You got all it takes. No. He said, that's not even important. The important thing is, I will be with you. I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So Moses needed to follow in faith. He had a strong faith 40 years before when he killed the Egyptian, but but he wasn't really feeling it now, you know? I, he's out in the wilderness. He's a lowly shepherd. He's basically got his staff, his, the shirt on his back, and a bunch of sheep, and, and he's like, that's all I got, but I'm going to protect what I have, you know? And m- so many of us feel that way. Remember when Cleve was talking about this sort of managed happiness that we have, you know? We've sort of made a little life, and we think maybe... One day we'll do something different. Well, and we never think that one day is going to come because we're so busy protecting that little life that we have. You know, every day, I know how that is. Every day we're living paycheck to paycheck and we're struggling along and we're trying to hold on to our relationships and we're trying to hold on to our, to our money and we're trying to deal with life. Life keeps coming at us just 
relentlessly attacking and attacking. The thief keeps coming to steal and to kill and to destroy it. All kinds of stuff is happening. Um, and just like Moses, he's like, man, uh, this is all I got. The shirt on my back, the rod, sheep. Uh, I got a family back yonder. And, and, and God is saying that he needed to take a step. <laughs> and that step is to let go of your false security. Let go of your false security. Exodus 4, starting in verse 1. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him. Okay, so he's saying, They're not going to believe me. I got nothing to give. I'm this lowly shepherd, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and so the Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? What's that in your hand? And he said, it's, it's a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. <laughs> and Moses is like, well, wait a second here. This is all I got. I got my staff. I got these sheep. I got the shirt on my back. That's it. And God is saying, throw it on the ground. Get rid of that staff. You know, it, it may not look like much, but it helps him keep the sheep in line. And, you know, it helps him to fight off the... Anybody who's kind of trying to come attack the sheep and it, it, something he can walk with and he can lean on when he's tired of watching sheep, it's something. You know, it's his little life. God wants to take that little bit, just throw it on the ground. He swallowed hard and continuing in verse 3. So he threw it on the ground. And what, and what happened? He threw it on there. It's not going to happen now, but I'm going to throw it on the ground. Uh, it became a serpent, right? He threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, right? And then what does it say Moses did? He ran. So Moses, and Moses fled from it. You would too, wouldn't you? I mean, I hate snakes. I, I remember the neighbors used to get snakes sometimes. Across the street, there would be snakes, and I always sent Sam over there, right? Remember that one? I don't even like the little gardener snakes, you know? I was so glad I had a boy named... Boy like Sam, who is like the snake hunter. He loves it, you know. <laughs> but, but I hate snakes, you know. And Moses has never seen his entire life turn into snakes before, okay. He throws down his little bit of security. It becomes a snake, and Moses has fled from it. He ran, and you would too. Uh, God started turning his trusty rod into a snake. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. It'll hold up. No, no. Lord, you, are not, you have not been around here. Do you realize what snakes do when you reach in and try to grab the snake? Snakes bite. This is a hissing snake. I am not about to grab it. But God said, what? Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. Okay. So he stretched out his hand and caught it. Got it. And what does it say happened? It became a staff again. It became. But uh, not the same old staff. <laughs> Moses took this little step of faith. He stretched out his hand. He caught it. It became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Can you imagine? His rod becomes a snake, and then it became a rod again. Don't miss this. Jump to Exodus verse four, or chapter 4, 17. And we're going to read on. It's 17. He's talking about the staff, the rod in Moses' hand. You shall take in your hand this staff with you, with which you shall perform the signs. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And he's got to take care of stuff with Jethro. He had some obligations to take care of. And then Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Verse 19. Now the Lord said to Moses in, in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. Well, that's good news. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And this is the part I wanted you to see. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. You see that? The rod of Moses became 
the rod of God when he let it go and he gave it to him. There's an old song by Ken Miedema that tells this whole story. I'm going to sing the very end of it for you. It says, uh, Do you know what it means, Moses? Do you know what I'm trying to say, Moses? The rod of Moses became the rod of God. With the rod of God, strike the rock and the water will come. With the rod of God, part the waters of the sea. With the rod of God, you can strike old Pharaoh dead. With the rod of God, you can set the people free. What do you hold in your hand today? To what or to whom are you bound? Are you willing to give it to God right now? Give it up, let it go, throw it down. I think so many times we have a passion from God but we see our own inadequacies. And all God is saying, I gave you that passion for a reason. Throw it down. I want to use you. I want to use that passion. And we think we're not able. Who am I? And that's the last point. You know what? God is able. God is able. We memorize this verse a couple months ago, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able. <laughs> who are we giving glory to? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory. You know what? The glory is not for you anyway. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that we are in a dark world, that there is a thief who comes to steal and to kill, and to destroy. And God, we know that it's a major deal. There's just so many ways that that thief is coming and getting his way. But God, we know that we are the tools in your hand. And that, that picture we see of Moses holding up the staff is the same as that picture of you holding us. You use us to part the waters of the sea, to make a difference in this dark world, to strike the pharaohs dead that are attacking this world. God, help us to see what you want for us. Help us to have your passion that squares up with your word. Help us to make a difference. Whether it be in this church or outside the walls of this church, God, may we see your kingdom. We pray that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven, that we would be able to extend your kingdom, that we would be able to be used by you and not just look at our own inadequacies, but to see the gifts you've given us and to see the way you would work through us and use us as tool in, in your hand. What a privilege. God, it is a privilege to be a tool in your hand. And I pray, God, that this uh, 
this 30, 30 days, this one month to live campaign would continue to grow, that we would bring people back this Wednesday night to join us because this is the, the abundant life. Jesus came that we might have an abundant life. We don't have to be beat down by that thief who's coming to steal and kill and destroy. God, help us to spread it out. Help us to at least invite somebody to come Wednesday night or next Sunday and, and help us to serve in your strength, in your power, because you are great. You are our awesome God. And we thank you for the privilege that we get to be tools in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.